Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to another Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello. Happy May. <laughs> That's funny. Mm-hmm. As this episode drops. Yes. I was like, it's actually April, but yes. <laughs> uh, Just a couple quick things. Just a merch announcement, charity, and I think we're off and running then, right? Um, yeah. All right. A uh, very fun and simple logo tee featuring our book of ghosts icon. We also just dropped a bunch of fun new stickers. Uh, we made the werewolf drunk design a holograph- holographic sticker. Uh-huh. Also have bleeding eyes. Uh, the Buzz 103 bumper sticker and tons of new uh, designs uh, over on Time Suck side as well. So check the uh, sticker bin over at badmagicmerch.com. Where has DJ Honey been? I don't know. Is he on vacation? He's not, He's been on vacation. Okay. I he's hope gone. he comes back soon. Okay. All right. Well, I'll remember that. Uh, and then you wanted to talk about the DNA Doe Project. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm both scared to death and time suck. We talk a lot about death in a variety of ways. And while as a people, as a nation, we have such a deep fascination with murder mystery, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, it was still someone's grandmother or son or daughter, or, you know, whatever. Uh, so when a family loses a loved one in a cold case, yeah. you know, we can't really understand the effects of what that does to a family. And so the DNA Doe Project is a nonprofit with a simple humanitarian mission to identify John and Jane Doe's using investigative genetic genealogy. That is a mouthful. Uh Uh, But we wanted to give some healing back to those who have suffered such significant losses. Uh, It's a really cool project. You discovered it over on Time Suck. Yeah, I actually referenced them several times in the Bible Belt Stranglers slash Redhead Murders episode um, that came out just recently. Where in this uh, in this episode there was a bunch of unsolved mur- murders, you know, along these interstates over in uh, like Tennessee mm. and surrounding states, and some of these cases went unsolved for three decades. They just had Man. they had the remains. They just had no idea who the body was. They're just but they had some DNA, and this company was able to solve cases that a variety of investigative you know units were not able to solve for so many years. Yeah, because of what they specialize in, and then they're a nonprofit, so they do rely on donations. The more donations they get, the more cases they can solve. Yeah, and I, on the website, I want to say that they've solved over 80 cases at this mm-hmm. point. They've either is, directly solved or helped solve over 80 cases. Yeah, it's really a really cool thing that they've uh, chosen to do to give back to people who— I just kind of, like, I can't imagine being that family, like, someone in your family that you love so much goes missing. And yeah. at a certain point, you know, when, the, when a body is not turned up and the person hasn't turned up, they just say, like, you know— you should presume that they are dead because right. it's so rare. But there's that, that lingering feeling, I'm sure. Like, what if they're the rare if, exception? If, yep. And the, and it's so sad to find out that they are dead. But also, like, just, you know, again, going back to that episode, there was a lot of quotes from victims' families of, it's like, yeah, this is not the ideal outcome, but we assumed. Mm-hmm. And it just feels good to at least know. Yeah. There's that, no more wondering. Right. And then I feel like you can have some sort of proper burial. You can have a yeah. a headstone knowing if that's what, you know, your religion or sure. your beliefs are. But like if you have a grave site, then there's somewhere that you can go to visit knowing that it's not just empty, yep. knowing that, you know, your loved one's remains have been laid to rest. So uh, our donation amount is, of course, to be determined at this uh, point because we are recording this May episode in the early bits of April. Uh, but to learn more, please visit DNA doe project.org i wish you could see the way that i typed this out so many typos <laughs> <laughs> it is wow we uh do you want do you want to move over to your uh story preview you have one today right i just have one giant story this week uh yeah and it's a, a cool ongoing lifelong sort of a, a family situation it's, it's really cool okay i'm excited to hear it uh for my first story i have a really intense one Uh, Heads up, it does deal with sexual assault a little outside the realm of our normal subject matter. Uh, All I'll add about the first story is that it deals with a woman being tormented in a way not quite like what we've covered here before. Uh, 
Okay. Slightly new method of uh, paranormal torture. Okay. Uh, while the first story is an alleged modern encounter, the second story is an old one. Begins in the 17th century. Was a Sicilian nun tormented by the devil? And did the devil use her to write a strange, mysterious, cryptic letter that was only finally decoded a little over five years ago? Okay. Uh, once you're socked and cozied up, I'll begin. I have special socks this week from fan Kristen B, who clearly listens to both shows because these socks say Queen of the Suck. Oh, that's so nice. Cute, huh? Custom socks. Yeah. We have the best fans. Truly so lucky. So lucky. Are you ready? Uh-huh. I'm ready. It all started off so well. Isn't that how so many stories posted in places like this begin? Looking at some of the other stories here, I wish I could go back in time to before all this happened and just laugh them off. That's what I would have done. I wouldn't have believed any of this. I honestly hope you do not believe this story. It's better that way. But if something has also happened to you, I hope me posting this at least makes you feel less alone. That's why I've decided to type all this out to the best I can remember it all. Time now for the tale of the monster in the machine. $79. That's how much it cost to buy a refurbished iPhone that was only two years old at Best Buy. And it even came with a limited warranty. I remember thinking somewhat jokingly that the deal was too good to be true. And it was too good to be true. Much, much too good in a way that no one could have ever expected. Why would anyone ever worry about their phone actually hurting them? Why would you ever care about who used to own it or where it came from? Now I have to fight off paranoia because I worry about everything. Evil can attach itself to anything. I truly believe that after what I experienced. A used phone. How ridiculous. I'd laugh about it all if it wasn't so traumatic. It all started the very same night I bought it. 2.33 a.m. That was the exact time my new phone's alarm went off. When I woke up in my little downtown townhouse. I didn't think much of it that first night. I was able to just go back to sleep. I didn't have to work the next day. I don't really ever sleep in past 8 anyway, no matter how late I stay up. And I figured I had probably forgot to check the phone to see if any alarm had already set. Been set. But why would I? Refurbished phones are supposed to be wiped clean, aren't they? Reformatted, I think is the word they used. Just like getting a new phone, they said. So no alarm should have been set up yet. And who would set an alarm for 2.33 a.m. anyway? The next day I wondered if I had accidentally done it myself, the same way you make a pocket dial. Even though I keep my phone in my purse and out of my pocket, but whatever. I must have hit a series of buttons accidentally. I turned it off and I went back to bed. And if that was all I would have experienced, I wouldn't have thought any more about it. The next day, I set my phone up properly, downloaded my favorite apps, logged into my accounts. Everything was working fine. I double-checked the alarm settings to make sure no alarm was turned on for the middle of the night. It wasn't. I am positive no alarm was set. I had a great day. Took Ringo for a walk, my some kind of spaniel, Labrador, and maybe sheepdog mutt. I had dinner and drinks with some friends and came home and binged some trashy reality show. I was in bed by 11. I set my new phone on my nightstand, plugged it into charge, fell asleep, and then woke up promptly at 2.33 a.m. Now I was annoyed. But I'd also had a few glasses of wine and was very sleepy, so after turning it off, I did fall back asleep pretty fast. I didn't work the next day either, the last day of my weekend, and I spent quite a bit of time Googling the problem I was having. Most of the advice I found was the same. It was just a weird bug, a glitch, not that uncommon. I just needed to do a hard reset and that would fix it. So that's what I did. I gave it a hard reset, hoped that would be the end of it. And I went about my day. Another good one. I took Ringo to the dog park, went on a date that was a lot of fun. Didn't invite her home with me, but I thought about it. Had a glass of wine, okay, maybe two. And then since now I had to work the next morning, I was in bed by 10. I was out by 10.30 at the latest. And then, you guessed it, I was back up at 2.33 a.m. sharp. And this time, I was more spooked than annoyed. For starters, it felt like I was waking from a nightmare that I couldn't remember. I felt nervous and scared. And just for a moment, I thought someone was in my room with me, over in the corner past my nightstand, in the corner that lines up closest to where I sleep. As my eyes became clear, just for half a second, I really thought I saw someone standing there watching me, or maybe felt is a better word. I thought I felt someone there. But just as quickly as I felt that, before I began to scream or suck in my breath and run from the room or whatever, the moment passed. And then I assumed it was just some leftover feeling from whatever dream I had just woken up from. I still
still felt creeped out though. I turned off the alarm again, and now wide awake, I turned the lamp on my nightstand on. Ringo sometimes slept, sleeps in bed with me, and sometimes out in the living room, in his bed out there. Such a weird, moody dog. He wasn't in my room this night, but now I wanted him to be. He doesn't like being woken up from a deep sleep, but I woke him anyway, carried him into my room, and shut the door so he couldn't get back out afterwards. I wanted to turn my phone completely off, but I still needed my alarm for the next morning. So instead, I just made a note to take it back to Best Buy and talk to them about what was going on, if it kept acting up. I decided I'd do another hard reset the next day. Maybe there was some other kind of reset. And soon, I was back asleep. And I slept through the rest of the night without any further incident. I had a good day at work, no problems, but then not the best night. It felt like it wasn't just me and Ringo at home when I got back from work. I don't know how exactly to describe what I felt. I wasn't seeing anything. I didn't hear anything. It just felt like something was in the house with us, even if I didn't know where it might be. I couldn't stop thinking about my new phone now. Everything had been fine until I brought it home. I checked the alarm. Nothing set for the middle of the night. I watched some lighthearted sitcom, texted with some friends to try and take my mind off of anything heavy. I set up another date with the girl I'd seen the day before, and then I tried to go back to sleep. But it was harder that night. My room felt a bit dark, cold. Again, I made sure Ringo was in the room and in bed with me. Finally, I drifted off. That night, I did not wake up to the sound of my alarm. But I did wake up at exactly 2.33 a.m. I woke up to the sounds of sex. But not fun sex. Angry, rough, aggressive sex blaring at full volume. Just like the other night, I woke up from what felt like a nightmare I now couldn't remember, and again I thought I saw something in the corner. Actually, this time I did see it. It didn't disappear, not right away, and Ringo saw it too. He was growling and staring right where it was. He seemed as scared as I felt. We were looking at the dark outline of a man standing in the same corner as before, watching me. I could see the white of his teeth. I could tell he was smiling before he disappeared. The whole time I'd been staring at him, which was only for maybe two seconds, the sound of sex kept blaring through my phone. I grabbed it and saw it was open to my web browser. It was on some porn site I'd never heard of and definitely never searched for. Something really niche and violent. It seemed like some kind of rape fantasy. At least I hope it was just a fantasy. I won't go into a bunch of details. It was so graphic, so disturbing. I immediately wondered, was the girl acting or was something terrible actually happening to her? It made me instantly sick to my stomach and scared the bejesus out of me. And I knew it was somehow connected to the man in the corner. I was more scared than ever. The next day I took my phone back to Best Buy on my lunch break. I didn't tell them what my phone had started playing the night before, but I told them everything else. The non-paranormal stuff, anyway. They ran some kind of diagnostic test on it. Nothing came back as far as being wrong. Then they did some type of special reset, something just short of having it completely wiped blank again. I was glad I took it in, but also, I didn't feel very confident that they had fixed anything. I only even brought it in because it seemed like I should bring it in. The rational thing to do. But what about that thing in the corner? How is some guy from Geek Squad going to fix that? I was rattled the whole day. I wanted to just throw the phone away, but that still felt crazy. A crazy person throws their phone away because they think it's demonic or something, don't they? And I thought, I'm not doing that because I'm not a crazy person. That was my reasoning for still keeping it. That night was simply awful. My whole house felt so, so heavy. It felt like I was constantly being watched. I couldn't relax, so I decided to take Ringo for a walk after dark, but that didn't help. I took my phone, my cursed phone, in case I needed to call anyone. I worried that if something happened to me, my phone would just shut itself off or something, maybe play a video of someone laughing. But still, I felt compelled to take it, and I hoped I was just being paranoid. I still wanted to believe all the weird stuff that had been happening would just stop. The feeling of being watched continued for the entire walk with Ringo. It felt like we were being followed. Most of the time. Sort of. Sometimes it felt like someone was up ahead, watching and waiting for us to run into them. Waiting to do something to me. It's hard to describe. It felt like there was something all around me. Something really, really bad. That night, I didn't even bother with a sitcom or any texting. I went straight for some old sleeping pills I still had after a random bout with insomnia a few months earlier. I took a double dose and I was passed out cold by 10. All I wanted to do was sleep until at least 2.34, 2.35, 3, anything past 2.33. But that was not going to happen. I woke up to more of those horrible sex sounds, the same video as the night before, and now I realize that the woman in the video 
looked a lot like me, disturbingly similar. I was very groggy from the sleeping pills, but awake. Awake, but helpless. My limbs felt so heavy, my movements too slow. Ringo was growling. And he was up on one of the pillows, staring down at the foot of my bed. He had never done that before. Through my foggy, blurry eyes, I could immediately see what he was growling at. There was a man in my room, or at least the ghost of a man. The same man I'd been seeing in the corner, but now he was a lot more solid. I could clearly see some of his features, his blue eyes, crooked smile, short, messy brown hair, pointed chin. I could see exactly how he looked at me, and I wanted to throw up. He looked excited. He looked like a kid about to open the present on Christmas morning, the present they were sure had exactly what they'd been dreaming of inside, what they'd been longing for, and I was that present. He leaned forward and pressed his hands down on either side of my feet. I could feel him pushing down on the bed. Ringo started barking. The woman in the video playing on my phone now started truly screaming in what sounded like a lot of pain. The man in the video said things I'm not going to write here. And now the man in my room, a man who was somewhat translucent, too shadowy to be a regular person, but still real enough to be felt, he leaned forward and started walking his hands up along the sides of my legs. I struggled to move. I felt drugged. I was drugged. I'd done it to myself. Ringo was going crazy. The man now lifted one knee and pressed it down on the bed beside me, his hands moving to either side of my arms, his face directly above my chest. He leaned down lower, his face moving until it was only inches above my breasts. It looked like he was breathing in my scent. Next, he placed his other knee on the bed and his face slid up towards my own. His eyes were looking down into mine with so much excitement and so much hate. Now, suddenly, my body finally cooperated and I screamed. Ringo lunged forward as if to attack him and then fell off the bed when he tried to bite him. The man was gone. He had just vanished. I started sobbing as I grabbed my phone, closed the internet tab, then threw the phone across the room. What's wrong, Lana? Don't you want to play? The voice, a man's voice, was now speaking through my phone. Leave me alone, I screamed back. Come on, Lana, we're all alone. It can be our secret. Fuck you, I screamed again. Stay away from me. No. No, Lana, I don't think I will. I think I'm going to keep getting stronger, and I'm going to take what I want, you stupid whore. Now my phone started playing that same torture porn rape fantasy as before. I lumbered off my bed, grabbed my phone again, quickly held down the power button until I turned it off. Then I opened the door and threw it down the hall before slamming the door shut and locking it. A few moments later, from across my house, I could hear laughing. I could hear that video starting to play again. I felt like I was losing my mind. I wanted to scream and keep screaming until I woke up the neighbors. What would be the point? Also, despite how scared I was, I was also still really, really tired. Thank God, really. I wouldn't have fallen asleep that night if it wasn't for those pills. I snuggled up with Ringo on the bed again, and at some point, I nodded off. And when I woke up, I called in sick to work. I was in no state to deal with the world. I had to get rid of that phone. But first, I really wanted to understand what was happening. I wanted to know who was threatening me. And I thought of Justice, one of my oldest friends. Justice is a paranormal nut. I'd hesitated when it came to asking her about all of this before because I knew she would want to do something crazy, like bring her Ouija board over and try and contact whatever I'd been encountering. But now, now that was exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to know who or what this thing was. You probably think I'm stupid, right? Maybe I am. But I needed to try for some kind of closure on all of this. Justice came over at 6.30, right after she got done with work and stopped at home to grab her Ouija board. She also brought over another friend of ours, Martin. She said the session would work best with three of us. Martin would take notes while she and I did the communicating. Fine. I spent the day until they got there away from my phone, literally away from it. I locked into my car and stayed inside the townhouse most of the day with Ringo, doing some cleaning, watching some shows, taking him for a walk, anything to stay busy and not think about what had been happening. When Justice and Martin showed up, after giving me a big hug and getting me to eat a little bit, they set out some candles on my little round kitchen table, placing the Ouija board in the center and turned off all the lights. Martin sat across from Justice and I with a pad of paper and a pen. Justice, having always believed herself to be especially sensitive to the spirit world, said she would lead the questioning. Her and I talked about what to ask this thing, if we were lucky enough to contact whatever seemed to be attached to my phone or unlucky enough and try and figure out what it was and why it was attacking me. Foolish, I know, but I felt compelled Right before we began, Martin went to grab my phone and brought it back inside and placed it next to the board. When he came back a few minutes later, he said the battery was dead and asked if I wanted to charge it. Hell no. 
Absolutely not, I told him. I didn't want to give this thing any extra juice if we didn't need to. We turned off the lights. I didn't think that was a good idea, but Justice said the mood is important and the darkness will draw this kind of spirit in more than light, and we began. After making sure that I was okay to proceed, we started. We all held hands around the board, forming a circle, as Justice said. We call upon the spirit world and welcome any spirits here to talk with us. We would most like to communicate with a spirit that, uh, that has been witnessed these past few nights. Martin now grabbed his pen and Justice and I each put our index and middle fingers on the planchette. We moved the planchette over the letter G, the starting point, I guess in the center of the board. Justice asked, Is anyone here other than Martin, Lana, and myself? Nothing happened. After maybe four or five seconds of silence, Justice whispered, I can feel something. And she asked again, Is anyone here other than Martin, Lana, and myself? After another few seconds, it felt like an electric current was flowing through the planchette. It felt like it was vibrating. While this happened, the air in the room got heavier and a bit colder, and the candles lightly flickered. And then it moved over to yes. We all exchanged curious glances. We moved the planchette back to G. And Justice asked, Have you been waking up Lana these past few nights? Again, yes. My body broke out in chills. I could feel a distinct presence in the room with us now. We reset the planchette. Justice asked, What's your name? Again, the planchette began to move and Martin wrote down everything. N. A. T. E. Nate. Nate, is that correct? Yes. The air now felt so heavy and electrically charged. Are you connected to Lana's phone? M. I. N. E. Mine. It's your phone, Nate? Yes. After Justice sent a, can you believe this is really happening look, she now asked, why have you been waking Lana up? And now the planchette moved more quickly. I, W, A, N, T, H, E, R. I want her. Ugh. And then it started doing it again. And as it did, I knew that the shadow man was somewhere in the room. I, W, A, N, T. I don't want to do this anymore, I erupted. Say goodbye, Justice. Say goodbye, I demanded. I could tell Justice and Martin were getting creeped out and scared, too. They'd also had enough. They felt something near us, something bad. You're scaring us, Nate. We're gone today. Goodbye. I, W, A, N, T. It felt like the planchette was aggressively pulling our fingers around. The energy of the room was so dark, the candles were flickering. Goodbye, Justice yelled. And we pushed the planchette to the word goodbye at the bottom of the board. Oh my God, what the fuck was that? Justice screamed out. She was really frightened and so was I. And then suddenly Martin stared directly at me and in a voice that was not his own, a voice I recognized from the phone, he yelled, I want you, Lana, and I will have what I want. And then he lunged across the table and grabbed me. Ringo started barking wildly and the phone, dead battery and all, started playing that fucking video again. Justice screamed and we both started hitting our friend. Let go, let go. Smash the phone, I yelled. And as Martin began to rip on my shirt, Justice took the phone and threw it as hard as she could against the wall. It distracted Martin and again, Martin seemed to become himself. What is happening? He cried out. Give me what I want! I now heard being yelled from my phone. The screen was shattered, but it was otherwise intact. I raced over and grabbed it, slammed it on the counter, and quickly pulled out a big meat tenderizer from the drawer. And I brought it down on my phone over and over again. Give me what I want! You and that was the last thing we heard, as the next blow completely shattered the phone. And then I hit the biggest pieces a few more times. Next, not slowing down, I grabbed a dustpan and started sweeping off the pieces. Justice, grab a garbage bag, I yelled. She pulled out one from under the sink as Martin sat at the table with his head in his hands. That thing had took a lot out of him and he seemed a bit dazed. We dumped all the pieces into a bag. Then the three of us, at my insistence, walked a few blocks over to a little bridge over the river that cuts through the park downtown. I grabbed a big rock I found along the way, tossed it in the bag as well. And in the middle of the bridge, I threw that bag as hard as I could out into the water. And down it went. And it was over. But who was Nate? Justice got her phone out and typed the words Nate, rapist, died, and the name of our city. We checked the news and sure enough, a few weeks earlier, some guy named Nate, a convicted rapist who'd been recently released from prison, had died. No death details were given about his cause of death, but in some Facebook and Reddit comments, there were rumors of both a drug overdose and also that he had been killed. And there were more rumors of recent rapes he was suspected of. Supposedly, the police were just starting to look into him before he died. And when I saw his photo, I shuddered. It was, for sure, without a doubt, the man from my room. 
It was his phone. It must have been. The phone he used to watch so many horrible videos on. I'm sure of it. Maybe he even took videos of the women he'd hurt and watched them over and over. All that dark energy, all centered on his fantasies and that phone. And I guess a part of him entered the phone when he died somehow. I think. I don't know. I'm just glad it's all over now. I got another phone a few days later. I didn't want to. But life in the modern world doesn't really work out without one. This time, I got a brand new one. No more used anything. At least not for a while. Maybe forever. <laughs> Scary new possibility. Yeah, like new possibility asterisk. Just, just, just as far as device. Well, yeah, I was going to say, because it's like, you know, we talk about all the time about spirits yeah. being attached to objects. So it's not that different. Right. And I think about like uh, how many stories we've had where there's a, like a TV that gets turned on. And it mm -hmm. uh, there was a story not that long ago. It was it wasn't even uh, like that scary of a of a thing that it would do, but like the spirit would turn on a TV and would always play like the Andy Griffith show or something. I can't remember. I think it was on my side of the Yeah, that's yes, that's totally very familiar. Yes, yeah, yes. So like yeah, a, TVs have been frequent, like uh, uh -huh. yeah. and then like radios, like we had a story a long time ago a mm. long time ago that was very confusing. Uh with like a, a typewriter or a radio or something where it was like multiple eras where it was like a spirit from like, I don't know, I want to say like the 18th or 17th century, but then was somehow yeah. communicating with like the, oh, you know what I'm talking yes. about? Yes, it was an early word processor. That's what it was. I knew it was I something forgot about that it, over in England. So, it, I mean. It that was a very odd story. Yes, yeah, yes, it yes. was very bizarre. Uh, so, yeah, I guess my point being that new ish yeah i think the the element that is most new is the the torture porn or like the it's showing something like really wanting to scare somebody yeah and then how i don't know like how does he come through the phone and then climb up on the bed because i don't well i guess we have seen that in a variety of ways of like you know the the deceased the spirit yeah. whatever the lost soul is trying to make its presence known by turning things on. It, it's just this element of like such anger, like showing yeah, such angry things. Like it's not showing the Andy evil. Griffith show. And no. it's not just like typing out a poem on a word processor. Yeah. And I guess the, the electricity that comes from a phone, it's like these things uh, in the past, we've seen numerous examples of like they feed somehow off electricity and also fear. Mm -hmm. And that combination, I wonder if like, did it just make it stronger? Yeah. Is that how it's able to kind of like escalate and suddenly like, you know, move out of the phone and stuff that it's attached to if it's using that electricity, using the fear around it? I mean, I hate that my brain goes here, but I do have to contemplate that if Lana had not yeah. done anything about it or if she had kept that. the phone, a bit, like would we have a, let's see, like would that be an incubus. incubus? Yeah. Would we have mm -hmm. an incubus situation here? Right, right. Which is always so hard to wrap your head around. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not discounting it. Yeah. It's just so impossible for me to think of that being a reality. Yeah. 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 Ah. Incubus, succubus. Yep. It's very disturbing. Very disturbing. So probably no photos to go along with this? Well, no pictures associated with the story. So I decided to uh, pick a palate cleanser. Okay. Just uh, This is a picture of a dog cuddled up and sleeping with a smaller dog with a weird little grin on its face. Oh my God. That is the cutest. <laughs> it's like the dog has a toy dog. Oh my gosh. Like a little wiener dog. Uh -huh. And I like that the wiener dog is out, but like with the weirdest little grin. <laughs> He's got a little, little happy smile on his face. He's adorable. He, they both are. Oh man, I was giving a good snuggle to Penny this morning. Aww. She was so sweet. Mm -hmm. She is sweet. She can be. She, she can, can also be. be a real butthead. Mm -hmm. She is so pushy. Golly. So is Ginger now. Mm -hmm. She learned from her. I know. No shortage of personality though, too. No, no. Ginger, my, my favorite thing that Ginger's doing now is her... Yeah, her weird little breath noise. <sighs> yeah, when she wants something, like Penny will bark. Penny yep. will speak. Mm -hmm. Ginger just instead goes... <sighs> yeah, just a weird, like doesn't even open her mouth. You just It has to be really quiet and then you just hear her... <sighs> It's generally around wanting <laughs> peanut butter. Yep. Or if like she wants to go outside, a special thing. Yeah. Ah, she's such a weird dog. Mm -hmm. Man, that story is, it's its heavy, it's creepy. And it, mm -hmm. we're, and we are so attached to our phones that mm -hmm. like, you know, when she says at the end, like, you know, well, I had to get a new phone. I immediately thought like, well, if that was previously an <laughs> iPhone, you should probably switch to Galaxies. Or, I don't, yeah, yeah. Not that that makes a difference, but it, in my brain it would. 
Oh my God, get an old rotary phone. Oh yeah. You get, you get like a flip phone. <laughs> you get a pager. Yeah, actually, yeah. that's how you do it. Man, <laughs> man. I was trying not to laugh too, or I just had this like thought about the Geek Squad guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yesterday, Kyler had a awards banquet that we went to, and there was this one kid from this one school who, you know, won this scholarship and he refurbishes computer actually a lovely thing that he mm-hmm. does, a really beautiful thing. This child refurbishes computers uh for low income schools. Yeah. When he came up to receive his award, I was like, that is exactly who I would expect to speak to a geek squad. One hundred percent. Yeah. He had like really long hair. He's really sweet, kind of meek. I was like, that's mm-hmm. the geek squad guy. Yep. Yep. Uh, funny. Yeah. Oh, stereotypes. So that was my bigger story. You ready to hear a little baby story now? Man. Yeah, I would like that out of my head. I was thinking about just like the guy crawling up the edge of the bed like wow i slept yeah. with my feet off the edge of the bed last night because i was getting yeah. so hot and i couldn't get the dogs to move mm-hmm. and that is an inherently creepy kind of feeling i know, I know. I still, yeah i still think about like something grabbing my foot when i do that i know i know i guess if you're not inclined to think yeah. about those things it probably doesn't bother you but ugh. okay this next story not very long at all just a quick look back into what uh may have happened in a sicilian convent in the late 17th century oh my god i'm watching <laughs> You're, you don't watch White Lotus, but I am watching the second season of White Lotus and it takes place in Sicily. And I wish I wish that you could have the point of references in my brain that I have right now. They're <laughs> so good. Okay, a little bit of setup. And then I'll just share the paranormal aspects of this odd little slice of history. Isabella Tomasi, born in Italy in 1645, was said to have come from a good family. She grew up in a wealthy, well-respected noble house in Sicily. Isabella was the daughter of Prince uh, Giulio Tomasi di Lampedusa. <laughs> what a name, Julio. Yep. <laughs> uh, Isabella was a bright, pious child devoted to her faith from a very young age. At the age of 15, it was decided that she would enter the Benedictine convent, Palma de, or Palma de Monte I Quirio. Monte Quirio. Upon entering the convent, she was baptized under her new name of Sister Maria Crucifessa della Conce Zioni. These are some... Of hardcore Sicilian names. Uh-huh. And she was ready to devote her life to serving God. By all accounts, Sister Maria adapted to life in the convent very well and very quickly. She became popular with the other nuns, known to be hardworking and extremely devoted to her faith. And then suddenly, after a full 16 years at the convent, something changed. Time now for the tale of a letter from the devil. Strange things now began to happen at the convent. The other nuns began to hear odd, disturbing noises coming from Sister Maria's room at night. It all started out inconspicuously compared to what it would become, whispering in what seemed to be another language, quiet laughing and what felt like conversations with another, even though Sister Maria was known to be in her sleep quarters alone. Over time, the noises grew louder and more aggressive sounding, as if Sister Maria was having a heated argument with someone. Sometimes it sounded like a wild animal was with her in her room. Then soon, blood-curdling screams filled the convent. Sister Maria's pain cries would now ring out throughout the night. The nuns and priests in charge of the convent looked into Sister Maria's torment and discovered that she had confided in her closest friends that she believed that the devil himself was trying to possess her, that she could hear him whispering in her ears. Most disturbingly, her friends reported witnessing that when Sister Maria now approached a holy object, she screamed and even sometimes lost consciousness. When her superiors now assigned her chores near the altar to ascertain if there was any truth to these new troubling reports... Sister Maria could be seen writhing around on the floor in agony whenever she got too close to the altar. As the days passed, Sister Maria's situation, she was now under careful observation, grew worse and worse. She began walking around as if lost in a trance half the time. When not in the trance, it was worse. She became incredibly, incredibly distressed and would talk incessantly about the devil trying to turn her away from God. Or she'd snarl and make the sounds of a beast. Then on August 11, 16, uh, 1676, Excuse me, Sister Maria was found lying on the floor of her room. The nuns who checked on her were shocked by what they found. Sister Maria was again lost in a trance, but now, in addition to also writhing around on the floor, her face and hands were drenched in ink, and she was clutching a piece of paper in one of her hands. Many other papers laid around her as if Sister Maria had spent the entire night writing letters, strange letters. The letters were written in symbols and alphabets that the nuns could not decipher. When she finally snapped out of her trance, even Sister Maria couldn't tell them what any of it meant. Maria also claimed no memory of writing the letters. She claimed that the devil 
must have had possessed her and forced her to write them in an attempt to turn her away from the path of God. Because no one could translate the letters, no one was quite sure what to do about them. Abbess Maria Seraficha wrote a first wrote a first-hand account of what was happening to Sister Maria. She wrote that the letters were the result of Sister Maria's battle with innumerable evil spirits. She said that Satan tried to force Maria to sign the letter, but Sister Maria resisted him by writing Oime, which means, O oh, me. This was the only word in the letter that could be deciphered at the time. Only one of Sister Maria's letters survived the passage of time, and 341 years later, in 2017, the note would finally be deciphered which was lucky for Sister Maria. If the note had been deciphered straight away, she would have likely been executed for heresy. Researchers at the Ludum Science Center in Catania, Sicily, led by director Daniel Abate, were the ones to decipher the strange letter. The researchers determined that the letter was written in a combination of the ancient Greek, Latin, runic, and Arabic alphabets. Abate and his team broke Sister Maria's code using decoded decoding software they actually found on the dark web. Abate told the Times of London, We heard about the software, which we believe is used by intelligence services for code breaking. We primed the software with ancient Greek, Arabic, the runic al alphabet, and Latin to unscramble some of the letters and show that it really is devilish. Now they knew that Maria's letter stated, Humans are responsible for the creation of God. This system works for no one. God thinks he can free mortals. Perhaps now, Styx is certain. God and Jesus are dead weights. They were only able to decipher 70% of the 14-line letter, most of which still does not appear to make any sense. The translation I just read also is not exact. It has been rephrased and punctuated for modern English speakers. Abate told Live Science that Sister Maria may have had bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, saying the image of the devil is often present in these disorders. It is certainly possible that Maria was not possessed and instead suffered from a serious mental illness, which at the time would not be understood at all, but also possible that Maria was the victim of demonic possession. How did that nun, outside of paranormal help, come up with a code sophisticated enough to take over 340 years to break? Although the message in Sister Maria's letter has now mostly been decoded, the circumstances surrounding how and why she wrote it remain a mystery. Perhaps someday, the rest of the code will be broken, and based on what is found, it will be easier to determine if mental illness or true possession was behind its authorship. It is not known if Sister Maria ever recovered from either her mental illness or some sort of spiritual affliction. Man, what a weird thing I never thought about of like mm -hmm. uh, possessions in times before we understood what mental illness yeah. was like we just assumed mental illness was some sort of possession from the devil or right or we would just say oh they've gone mad they've gone crazy but we didn't understand the varying degrees of bipolar schizophrenia yeah, multiple totally. personality like so just depression yeah. right yeah absolutely so how shitty to be her and to like have something happening to you that you don't understand yeah. and then the world around you doesn't understand and they're just like well i guess it's the devil right that's Truly. crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. That's most of human history. Absolutely. I mean, I have massive bouts of depression. I mm -hmm. never think it's the devil. <laughs> right, right. Like that's not even an option in my brain. <laughs> it's just like, all right, no, time to up the meds, mm -hmm. get more sunshine, get mm -hmm. more sleep, like whatever, you know, yeah. get back into therapy. It's crazy. Uh, I have some pictures. Okay. This first one is the Benedictine convent, Palma di Monte I Chirio. Palma di Monte I Chirio. You're really good at Italian. <laughs> Beautiful. I it mean, beautiful. old structure. And then uh, this next one is Sister Maria's surviving letter. That is something. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go with possession on this because like they noted, or as if, as you noted, how could she know all of those languages and co uh, It's pretty sophisticated alphabets. code. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and here's a recent photo of Satan just for fun. This is oh, Satan cool. dating 2020. An ad that Ryan Reynolds Marketing Company made for Match.com that I totally forgot about. Wait, what? I've never seen this. I, you know, I think it was on like a, a Super Bowl a couple years ago. And and then and then the same character was used in a variety of ad campaigns, but just like this goofy big bodybuilder devil. And here, like I, I did actually watch this commercial. I was like, oh yeah, I, I forgot about it. But um, she represents 2020. He always he obviously represents evil. And it was a funny ad for the time where he's just talking about how she just really gets him and just like, um, um, and he just really like appreciates like her level of torment. And j just like, <laughs> it's yeah, ridiculous ad. I like his weird furry legs. 
Mm-hmm. Like, what's that about? I never thought about the devil having furry legs. Oh, yeah, goat legs. Oh, goat legs. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. To me, in this angle, it just looks like some furry chaps. <laughs> yeah. How weird. Who's the actor in there? Do we know? Um, I looked him up, and uh, he's not like a, a known actor. He's a... Um, He's a huge bodybuilder. He's uh, like, like, like a very tall one. I think he's six seven. Holy Hades! Is it Michael Hare? Uh, no, it's not Michael Hearn. He's not that tall. I don't know who that is. Uh, or Mike A. Hearn. Um, he's a a bodybuilder. I've talked to Tyler about. Oh, like he, he was a guy who used to be one of the uh, I think American Gladiators. Oh, I loved that show. Mm-hmm. But he's like, um, whatever happened to American Gladiators? Didn't they try and bring it back? Yeah, there was a resurgence, a reiteration. Yeah, I don't know that it worked. I don't think so. But but that guy, uh, I, I do follow him on Instagram. He just um, he's so ridiculously strong, but he has like a very normal face. Like a lot of times when those guys get so huge, yeah, their faces get roided as well. Yeah, and his proportions, it's like he was meant to be that bit, and he's like a weirdly handsome guy for being so massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, and then just freakishly strong. Like it's just uh, it's like, hard you, to hard to understand. Do you think he could pick me up? I think he could throw you across the room. <laughs> and me yeah yeah exactly <laughs> all of us at once like our whole team yeah she's like got like Tyler and Logan in one hand and then like you and me and the other like yeah. holding us by like the napes of our necks or whatever like we're little puppy dogs he, he's yeah he's ridiculous where like if if he was like on a, on a bench and, uh-huh. and Tyler and I could just balance like plank well enough yeah he could just use us like dumbbells like just do like a press with two guys that are you know, in the, in the mid two hundreds, as far as weight, like he's that he's that strong. Does he do like Iron Man compet or not Iron Man, uh, strong man competitions, or is that because that's a different kind of thing? No, right? those some of those guys are even stronger. I don't uh, get it. And, and they tend they don't look like him. He has a very like I would say what uh, like Greek god kind of like you know hmm. physique. And he's handsome. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. You want to see him? <laughs> I do. Uh, the, oh, yeah. the, uh, see this. The other guys. Muffin. The other guys. I um, mean, the strongest man. They're more like um, blocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just built. For pure, I mean, and just like, how is he also like not like a Jason Momoa actor? Maybe he's not a good actor. I don't know. I mean, like, listen, this is controversial. Yeah. Is The Rock really a good actor? He is. He's got charisma. Okay. Okay. He's got comedic timing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he's not like. He's if, not going to do like a like a deep role. No, I, I think he's really for me. I think he's really good at what he does. Yeah. But if like I'm not going to go see some indie flick where he's like digging deep for a mo- I mean, maybe he could do that and just has chose not to. Right, right. I or would, maybe I like put it past him. I know it's so hard so to talented. when you get um, typecast. Mm-hmm, true. It's like so he might be able to do that. You're stuff. also not going to expect that out of like a. Well, okay. Well, it's like when yeah. Jim Carrey did um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yeah, people great. did not think that that was going to be possible from mm-hmm. him. But, you know, he tapped yeah. into his own struggles and blah, blah, blah. But that Mike guy, I think I think he has a very successful, um, some kind of nutrition and like uh, training company. Okay. Well, I would hope so. Yeah. He could also be like an underwear model. Totally. Like, yeah. That's his main thing is like modeling. Modeling? Yeah. Oh, is it really Tyler? Yeah, he's that a, makes sense. a like, fit, that makes sense. model. That makes sense. Oh, that yeah. I'm like sense. a fitness model. Yeah. He yeah. doesn't look like a lot of times I, for me personally, that's not a look that I enjoy. Like right. even that, like while he's very handsome, yeah. that is just too much for me. I, I don't care for that at all. I, I'm amazed at him because for someone his size, as big as he is, yeah. he's so much stronger than he even looks. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just like, what is going on? Just like great genetics plus years of good training. Yeah. Yeah. What I was going to say is like his face has a lot of times when guys are like that, as you yeah. were saying, you know, their face gets a little like distorted and like whatever supplements and drugs yeah. and stuff they're taking to be that strong, like really, I don't know, does something to their skin, but he's, he's, he has a pretty face. Mm-hmm. Right. He he's the guy who he he walks into the bar and immediately for every other guy there, it's a competition for second place. Oh. I, w- I would choose you over him. Well, that's nice. I don't know that I would choose me over him. I would. I don't like that. All right. That's not my thing. <laughs> it never has been. I don't I don't care for that at all. I mean, he's handsome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can appreciate it, but it kind of freaks me out. Okay. I like this. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Who are you going to hang on to this week? I got week? traditional again. Oh. Mm-hmm. oh. Yeah, we just got some new ones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When yeah. we were in uh, Cleveland and Columbus. A bag full of them. I will say the pink Layla... Is the one Layla we don't have. Maybe, maybe she doesn't exist. No, she, oh, we saw her online. That's right. And we saw her in person. Somebody brought her. Oh, that's right. And said, can you autograph this? That's right. And I want to take it with me. And I thought like, oh, okay. You know, I was a little bit sad. <laughs> but that's the one color we don't have. We got some like bright royal blue ones coming in. But the pink yeah. is mm, it's tough yeah, to yeah, find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Daniel Boone. You ready? I am. All right. 
Hello there, bad magic fellas. I'm Zach. I'm a creep and a mechanical scaler in an underground mine. Very cool job. Wow, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. I'm a very big skeptic who questions nearly everything. Though I'm not religious and do not believe in a heaven or a hell, I do believe that spirits can be trapped or bound to objects. Hmm. This is a true and ongoing tale about the spirit believed to be attached to what is now considered a family heirloom of sorts. Okay. So I really love this story. Though my, rev- though my relevance and firsthand accounts took place mostly in my teenage year, the teenage years, this story starts several years before my birth when my mother was just a little girl. In 1972, my grandfather purchased a home in Chester, Illinois. Upon moving in, the house was completely empty except for a large trunk in the attic. The trunk was covered in stickers from nearly all of the states and even from some other countries. It had been all over the world. It had once belonged to a man named Robert Dunkel, who had previously owned the house two buyers before my grandfather. When stood upright, the large, worn, rectangular chest could be opened and unfolded to make a dresser of sorts. My grandfather had no use of this old antique, but my mother had always protested the idea of throwing it out. Even though it reeked of cigarette smoke and she didn't know its history, she was very drawn to it. My mother would hold on to this antique and keep it in her possession throughout her entire life. Since my birth, everywhere we would move, the trunk would accompany us. Sometimes it possessed uh, sometimes it posed as a coffee table, sometimes an end table. It had been used as a dresser, it had been used as scrapbook storage, and even sometimes as mere decoration. Wherever we went, so did the trunk go. It seemed to have something paranormal attached to it. Wherever we put it, we'd occasionally hear footsteps, have objects misplaced, or see doors open and shut on their own in the surrounding area. Every time an occurrence like this took place, we'd smell the distinct smell of full flavor cigarettes. This smell was always accompanied the smell always accompanied Robert's stunts and seemed to allow us to tie all the encounters together. In the summer of 2005, when I was transitioning between 4th and 5th grade, my family moved from our country farmhouse, about 15 minutes outside of Perryville, Missouri, to just inside the small town. My father purchased a nice house that had just been built on an empty lot, and we would be the first to ever live in it. Upon opening the front door, the staircase down to our partially finished basement was immediately to your right. My older brother and sister's bedrooms were down there along with our family room where Robert Dunkel's trunk was being used as a coffee table. A few steps forward and you would find yourself standing in the living room. To the left of the living room was our garage access and a few more steps forward and you'd be standing in the dining room. To the left of this was the kitchen and to the right was an archway that led to a parallel running hallway. My bedroom was on the right end of the hallway and my parents was on the left. In between them was my little brother's bedroom and a bathroom. I was excited for the change, but I knew that I would miss the endless space to roam around and ride four-wheelers, the comfort of our old hiking trails, and most of all, our family bonfires we'd had on a regular basis. This move was going to be a big change for me, and more would change than I ever had thought. The first occurrence happened to me shortly after Christmas. Having recently gotten into video games, I had just received a brand new Turtle Beach headset. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled because this particular headset, like almost all headsets nowadays, would play the game audio through it as well as your online chat audio. This was a huge luxury to my young self because it meant that I could stay up way past my bedtime without having to worry about waking up my parents and getting into trouble. One school night after everyone went to bed, I hopped I was hopped up on a game with my new headset and started in on Call of Duty Black Ops. I played this game religiously and I actually got pretty good at it. This particular night, I had stayed up gaming until about midnight when I began to hear footsteps. I quickly pulled my headset off. They sounded like they were coming up the basement steps. Thump, thump, thump. They were loud. My dad is flat-footed and my mom has always joked that his footsteps sounded like an elephant's. Thump, thump, thump. But what was he doing in the basement? Thump, thump, thump. He'd reached the top step. Thump, thump. I quickly leapt up, shut off my Xbox and the TV, and threw myself into bed. The footsteps had made their way through the living room and into the hallway. Thump, 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 thump. 
I rolled over away from the door and pulled my comforter up over my shoulders and tried to lay as still as I could. The footsteps continued approaching and finally stopped just outside of my bedroom door. My heart seemed to stop as I waited for the door to open, but it didn't. He must be listening to see if I'm up. I thought to myself, and after about 20 seconds, the footsteps slowly began to recede away from my bedroom door. Thump, thump, thump. I took a deep breath, and then I lost it again. I had expected the footsteps to head towards my parents' room, but they didn't. The footsteps continued back the way they had come, through the living room, back down the steps. Now, at this point, I assumed it was my older brother fucking with me. We just had that kind of relationship. The next day, I asked him about it, and he assured me it wasn't him. I was up later than that, and I didn't hear anything, he said. I didn't have the balls to ask my parents if it was either of them. I hadn't thought that it could have been Robert Dunkel. At least, not yet. For the following week or two, everything seemed pretty normal. I didn't hear any footsteps, but I also chose not to stay up past my bedtime. That weekend, I made up for it, though, and did a lot of gaming. Those were the days when I could burn 14 straight hours of my life with a headset on and a controller in my hands without feeling like an unproductive piece of shit. (laughs) Everyone in my house went to bed about 10, but I didn't have a bedtime on the weekend, so I stayed up gaming with a buddy from school. About 1 a.m., I got the munchies and decided to make a pantry run for a Pop-Tart. Upon leaving my room, I immediately felt very cold and got the feeling that someone was watching me. I flicked on the living room lights and saw nothing. I was alone. So why did I feel this way? I quickly scurried to the pantry, grabbed the goods, and darted back to my room. I hopped back on the game for maybe 10 more minutes, and then I heard it. Thump, 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 thump. The sound was coming up from the bottom of the stairs. Thump, thump. I pulled my headset off and gave it my full attention. It was now in the living room, and as the sound grew closer, I found myself grinning. My brother wasn't going to scare me that easily. I crossed my legs, waiting for the steps to approach. Thump, 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 thump. The steps had made their way to my bedroom door. My grin grew wider. I expected the door to fly open and for him to scream, but it didn't happen. Was he listening for me again? I got up and approached the door. Scott? I asked, my voice starting to tremble. No answer. I reached for the doorknob and bang, it sounded like someone open hand smacked the doorknob right on the other side of the door. And then the footsteps receded back down their path faster as if the perpetrator was speed walking. Thump, 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 back through the hallway, living room and down the stairs. Thump, 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 thump. I immediately got goosebumps and my room grew very cold, but it didn't stop there. As soon as the footsteps had made their way to the bottom of the basement stairs, they turned around and headed right back up. Thump, 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 thump. Faster yet as if they were at a jogger's pace. I stood quietly beside my door as the steps approached. If this was some kind of joke or prank, surely my brother was about to wake up my father and get us both in trouble. Thump, 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 thump. The steps quickly made their way to my door and without hesitation, bang, it sounded like someone hit my doorknob again with a baseball bat or a hammer or something before turning around and heading back to the basement. Again and again and again, these steps, now at a sprint, seemed to charge their way to my bedroom door, hit the doorknob, and then run back to the basement. I was terrified, and tears began to roll down my cheeks. This routine happened six or seven times back to back before I finally mustered up the courage to open the door. I had to wait for the perfect moment. Thump, 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 thump. The steps were rounding the corner and into the hallway. Thump, 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 thump. And just as the steps approached my room, I sprung the door open and saw nothing. Nobody was out there, but something was. It looked like smoke was sitting in the air and it smelled of the distinct smell of full flavor cigarettes. Opening the door to put an end to the activity, uh, opening the door put an end to the activity, but I didn't get much sleep that night. My young mind was blown. Robert Dunkel was real. I told my parents about what had happened, and I think they believed me, but nothing changed. I spent a lot of time outside the next couple of weeks. I just needed to I just needed to be out of the house for a little while. After finding out about a local skate park in town, I decided to indulge myself in skateboarding. And to my surprise, there was another kid my age residing two blocks away who happened to be big into skateboarding. His name was Chris. And Chris was in the same grade as me and on the same bus route, too. And we quickly began hanging out on a regular basis and became very close friends. On school days, we would wake up early, skateboard or ride our bikes to school, and then after school, we'd ride home, finish our homework, and then play games until it was time to go to bed. On the weekends, we'd wake up early, 
grab a snack, and head straight to the skate park. Sometimes we'd be there until dark. My parents had only two rules. I had to be back by 10 p.m., and I had to bring my phone with me and answer it any time they called. Once or twice a month, I'd get a visit from Robert Dunkel. He'd do his normal stomping Mm -hmm. routine, and I'd get startled, but he never entered my room. And I knew that if I flung my door open, he'd just go away. I began telling Chris all about this. He seemed to humor the idea, but I could tell he wasn't fully convinced. One Saturday morning, my parents woke up early and said that they were headed into town for a grocery run. When they asked me if I wanted to come, I declined, explaining Chris and I had plans to go to the skate park. They told me to be safe, called them if I needed anything, and after they left, I checked the time, 9 a.m. Chris was going to arrive at 10. I got cleaned up, ate breakfast, and headed for my bedroom for my cell phone. Every single night before I went to bed, I placed my phone on my nightstand charger. And for whatever reason, on this particular morning, my phone was no longer on the charger. I pulled the nightstand away from the wall, looked around on the floor. No luck. I pulled my comforter off the bed and began searching through my sheets. Still no luck. I continued searching for my phone for the next 40 minutes, but had absolutely no luck finding it. At 9.50, there was a knock at the door. Come on in, Chris. I hollered. The door opened. Chris entered. Hey, man, what's going on? He asked. My phone's missing. I've been looking everywhere, but I can't find it. Have you tried calling it? He asked. I would, but I can't find the landline either. We looked a little more and then gave up. We left without finding my phone. We skated to the park, stayed for a good three or four hours. And then on the ride back home, my dad's truck pulled up next to us. Get home now, he said. When I got there, he was furious. I'd broken the rules. He'd called me and I didn't answer. Dad, I couldn't find my phone anywhere. It was just missing. Well, you have plenty of time for, to look for it now. You're grounded. No skateboarding for a week. I retreated to my room, and upon entering, I immediately saw my phone. It was sitting right there where I had left it the night before. It was on the charger, on the nightstand. Was I losing my mind? I had checked there thoroughly before I had left. I picked it up. My dad had called me several times, <laughs> but he wasn't the only missed call. I had a missed call from our landline, and there was a voicemail. I clicked on it. Hey man, what's going on? My phone's missing. I've been looking everywhere, but I can't find it. Have you tried calling it? I would, but I can't find the landline either. I dropped my phone where I stood. What the actual fuck was going on? The voicemail was of the conversation that Chris and I had previously had. After showing my dad the voicemail, he did let up some. He told me about an occurrence that he had had a few weeks prior. He said that he had come home from work one day early while everyone was at school and the house was supposed to be empty. After parking his work car in the garage and heading for the inside door, he had heard someone running through the living room and down the basement steps. He quickly grabbed his pistol and thoroughly (laughs) patrolled the whole house but found nothing. He would have called the police, but as he was headed back up from the basement, he got a whiff of cigarettes and knew it was Robert Dunkel. One Friday evening after school, Chris and I began to skate back to my house, making a quick detour at the local grocery store. We'd paid and changed for sodas and snacks, loaded up our backpacks full, and headed home for a long night of intriguing night of video games. When we got home, we greeted my family and ran off to my bedroom to start our gaming. The plan was to stay up playing Halo or Call of Duty until midnight, catch some sleep, and then wake up at 6 to head to the skate park. It was nearly 10 p.m. and we knew my parents would soon be going to bed. This is when we started to slow down on the caffeine and tried to lower the volume of our laughter. We'd done this countless times over the past couple years, but unfortunately, this would be the very last night Chris spent at our house. The stomping began pretty close to midnight. I'd already shut off my Xbox and sat in bed, but Chris hadn't made it that far yet. When I heard it, I began to grin. I had told Chris about Robert Dunkel hundreds of times, but like me, he was a see it to believe it kind of guy. Thump, 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 thump. The stomps made their way to the top of the steps. Isn't your brother worried about waking up your parents? Thump, 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 thump. I shook my head. What are you doing? Why are you grinning? Chris asked. Thump, thump, thump. The footsteps made their way down the hall. Just listen, I said. Thump, thump. Thump. The footsteps made their way to my door. Who is that? What's going on? Bang, bang. Thump, 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 thump. Chris leapt nearly two feet into the air, snapped his head in my direction, his eyes the size of half dollars. The footsteps receded back to the basement, now at a jogger's pace. They turned around and started back up the steps. Chris's jaw went slack and he connected the dots. Now do you believe me? I asked. Yeah, I think so. He responded. Thump, 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 thump. It was in the living room. Thump, 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 thump. We waited in silence. Bang!
bang. Chris jumped again before asking, how has this not woken up your whole house? I don't know. I can't explain it. How'd you say you can get it to stop? I just swing the door open and he goes away, I said. Chris nodded, implying that he wanted me to open the door. I waited patiently for the footsteps to get to the hallway. I swung the door open (laughs) and the same smoky odor filled my nostrils. That's it? He asked. I smirked and nodded. And as soon as I shut the door, there was then a loud bang on the doorknob. Now I was the one who jumped a foot in the air. Every time Robert Dunkel had fucked with me in the past, he'd stopped when I opened the door. So why not this time? Even faster, the footsteps raced down the steps and then right back up again and then bang, and we both jumped. I don't like this, Zach, Chris said, now pulling pictures off my bedroom wall. What are you doing? I asked. I have to take the pictures down with any uh, faces on them, he said. I'm worried they're going to wink or smile at me. I chuckled and began helping Chris pull the remaining wall decor down. Bang! We jumped again. The footsteps were now moving impossibly fast through the house, and this time I waited by the door. Just before they reached the door, I swung it open and shouted, Stop it! I smelled the smoke, and Chris did too. I turned around to look back at Chris. Okay, I think it's all right now. I slowly shut the door, but the doorknob was again smacked, and this time my hand was on the other side of the door. I threw my hand in the air, remembering that it felt like how it did when I touched our electric fence. I felt like I had just been shocked. The sprinting footsteps continued non-stop for hours upon hours that night. Chris wanted to escape through my bedroom window, but I told him my dad would be furious if he saw the screen out of place. He said he wanted to go home and sleep with the crucifix. Here, I said, I can help. I opened my closet door and pulled out an old box off the top shelf. I pulled out a precious moments Bible that my grandmother had given me as a gift when I was born. I opened the book and pulled out a ceramic crucifix. It was like a two for one Bible crucifix deal. Here, I said, want the Bible or the cross? Chris pondered on this for a moment and reached for the Bible. I lay flat on my back with the crucifix clutched in my right hand over my heart, and Chris did the same with the Bible. It felt like an eternity trying to fall asleep that night, but I guess eventually we did. I woke up in a panic to Chris shaking me the next morning. Dude, look at the cross. I opened my eyes, scanned the room until my eyes found the crucifix. It was still in my hand, but it was broken into several pieces. I released my grip on it, and the ceramic cross fell apart. This feels so wrong, I muttered. I'll see you later, buddy. I'm going home. Chris almost shouted, eager to get the hell out of our house. Chris left that morning and never came back. For the next couple of months, whenever I'd hear the footsteps, I'd just bolt down the hallway to my parents' room and crash on their floor. So far, this method seemed effective. Robert Dunkel never banged on their door and the footsteps couldn't be heard in their room. On normal nights where Robert and I, on normal nights where Robert would leave me the hell alone, I started letting our rat terrier sleep in bed with me. His name was Ozzy and he was roughly five or six. One night, a few months before my 18th birthday, I'd made my way to bed around midnight. I closed the door, shut off the lights and lied in bed and lifted the comforter so Ozzy could scurry in. And before I knew it, I was asleep and then awake, screaming in a panic. What was going on? I woke up to the sensation of someone or something grabbing my ankle and tugging on me hard. My comforter flew off. The dog soared across the room into the wall and my lights flicked on. I shot out of bed and ran to Ozzy. The hair on his back stood up as he was growling. I shouted with tears, rolling down my cheeks. Come on, Oz. I picked up the dog, ran down the hall to my parents' room. I woke them up and explained the events that had just taken place. My ankle didn't bruise, but it was bright red in the shape of a handprint. Even worse, my dog walked with a limp for a whole week. My dad sat me down and told me that he did believe me. He said he'd grown up in a haunted house too. I asked him why my siblings never experienced anything, and he responded by saying that not everyone could see through the veil. I still call bullshit, but who knows? (laughs) That was the last occurrence I had in that house. I slept on my parents' bedroom floor for the majority of the time until I moved out a few months later. I did come into contact with Robert Dunkel one more time, nearly eight years later. My dad flips houses as a side gig, and he told me if I helped him renovate one, he'd sell it to me for a damn good deal. So I, so I decided to do it. I bought a house in St. Mary, Missouri off of him, and upon moving in, he told me that they'd been using the unfinished basement for storage and that he'd get the rest of their stuff out shortly. The basement had a cellar exit and a, sed- and a staircase leading to the kitchen on the main floor. After a long day of moving furniture and boxes from our apartment to our new house, my girlfriend and I were absolutely exhausted. We had just showed up to the house with the last load of our apartment furnishings. I was taking basement boxes down to the cellar entrance and my girlfriend was taking the main level boxes 
through the back door. As I carried the last basement box down the cellar steps, I heard loud footsteps upstairs running for the back door. Hmm, she's in a hurry to get done, I murmured to myself. I sat the last box down and then proceeded to turn off the lights. My basement had seven lights on pull cords. I walked in a large circle, pulling all seven of the pull cords before leaving the basement. When I got back outside, my girlfriend was leaning on my pickup truck with an irritated facial expression. Hey, did you lock the back door? Wait, were those footsteps not hers? This was supposed to be our first night here and I desperately didn't want to ruin that. Well, I mean, I guess I may have. Take a breather in the cab of the truck while I run through the basement and unlock it. My mind went straight to intruder. I rarely thought about the paranormal anymore. I rushed down the cellar steps intending to grab my 40 caliber handgun that I had previously brought down there. But when I got down there, I didn't. When I opened the cellar door, all seven pull cord lights were back on, some of them still swinging. Accompanied by this was the distinct smell of full flavor cigarettes. I immediately got goosebumps and stopped in my place. A grin stretched across my face as I connected the dots. Well, hello again, I muttered out loud. It's been a while. I slowly staggered around in that same circle, pulling all seven cords to turn off the lights before going upstairs. When I approached the light, illuminating my parents' storage area, I saw it. I knew it would be there. Still, sitting on a pallet next to some old winter coats and boxes was Robert Dunkel's trunk. I got upstairs and realized that both the knob and the deadbolt were locked. She couldn't possibly have locked it herself, and so I made a sweep of the house, but I didn't bother grabbing the pistol. When I got outside, I took responsibility for locking the door. She wouldn't spend a single night in a house that she thought might be haunted. They'll pick up the trunk tomorrow, I thought, and she'll never have to worry about it. I've lied here. I've lived here for a year now, and it's been completely quiet ever since that first night. Though, if this gets featured and my girlfriend hears about the lock ordeal, I'm sure it'll be far from quiet. I also have to admit that I'm a total Darren. Call me crazy, but I have asked my mother if I could inherit that trunk from her when she passes away, and she agreed. I mean, that shit isn't ever coming back inside my house, but maybe in a storage unit or something, because let's be honest, a possessed trunk is just too damn intriguing to get rid of. Thanks for everything, Zach. Dang. Okay. Okay. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Oh, same thing, Zach. Yeah. Yeah. So we have pictures of the trunk of Robert Dunkel's truck. Yes. Yes. Because I became obsessed with this. I was like, I need to look this guy up after looking at these photos. Yeah. Yeah. So we have. Three... So you found pictures online, just not even from Zach. No, Zach sent the photos. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. So okay. So um, if we can pull up those photos, Tyler, um, we have three pictures. So this is what it looks like when it's opened, right? Oh, okay. okay. Do you yep, understand yep, now, yep. like uh-huh, how uh-huh. it's like a dresser type thing, like the Harry Potter books? Oh yeah. Exactly. Okay. And then this is the outside of the trunk. So it's hard to see, but it does have his name on it. This is how they found out it's Robert Dunkel. Right. So on it, it says Robert Dunkel uh, and it says like Lieutenant. Uh, so he was clearly in the army and it has yeah. like his like number. It's like a zero three. Um, And then it says that this was one of four trunks and it was, I think coming from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and maybe going to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And then we just have, yeah, it's like hard to see, but I spent hours Googling this guy yesterday. I became obsessed. And we have one more photo of the outside of the trunk. Oh, Bobbert. Um, You know, just like clearly from uh, like a... Like a shipping label. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. For the, um, like when we would have like UPS now, but this is a railway sure. ticket. So I couldn't stop thinking about this. I'm like, who is this guy? He right. was very clearly a real person. Right, who's Robert Dunkel? Okay, I cannot find like who this guy is. Okay. I did like Robert Dunkel, Robert Dunkel, Lieutenant, Robert Dunkel, Fort Wayne. But there is more to this story. And I like, I can't help but wonder if he is like trying to, to like, I don't know, solve his own murder, tell a story. Like, yeah. how did it end up there? Like, why? Like, was he from Fort Wayne? Was he from Portland? Like, where's right. there's something more to this, and I need some why like is, sleuthing help. Because, why is Robert Dunkel's spirit restless? I know what is going on. Uh, and then there's one weird, just the one anomaly was the when they had the sleepover when uh, he had the, Zach and Chris. Yeah. And then they woke up, and the crucifix that Zach was holding was broken. Yes. That's usually like a. Uh, in stories, you know, some kind of sign of not a ghost, but some type of like demonic presence. I, I mean, know. not always. That, that made me like just question, like, is this just this uh, harmless spirit of Robert Dunkel or something else? Or it could have been like, 
We've also come across stories where when one spirit is consistently hanging around a place, yeah. it's almost like they leave a door open mm -hmm. to be able to like do that and other things can come to the door. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I did like the the sprinting. It's like, this is the, the this I've never, I've never seen a spirit so consistently in a hurry. Uh, yeah, right. Like, like Dunkel's always running. Yeah. There's never like every instance of the footsteps, it felt like was not just a, a slow ta, 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 ta. It was do, 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 do. just this thing running around. And yeah, a lot of interesting uh, details where like when he would open the door, that would usually make almost like almost like Robert Dunkel was easily spooked. Yeah. Or it was like, gotcha, like a trick. Yeah, yeah. Like was he like was it was Robert Dunkel like a prankster? I know. I know. It is a, a very interesting case. And the dad also experiencing the loud footsteps running around, you know, his friend Chris. Uh, no, the dad didn't experience. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah, You're the right. One he did. Time the one when he time came home. That's the right. One time. So, so there was just like, it just went on for so long and then clearly attached to the trunk because then when the trunk makes it to the other property, that's where that happens there. And the mom, you know, first. The one who actually owns the trunk. Yeah. Right. Like, and she became drawn to it. It feels like a, a family like a shared possession or something. Yeah. Because he like says- the trunk wanted to be in this family. Yeah, like she or she became very attracted to it and wouldn't let her father get rid of it when they moved into that house. And oh, like, okay, going very back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So they move into this house who's been, it's been owned by multiple people. Right. Okay, okay, where the trunk originates from and the mom becomes very into it. Okay, the trunk is the only thing still in that house when they buy this and it's from- and it's had two previous owners. So that means the last two families that lived there yeah. also left that trunk behind. So Why? What yeah, what happened? Something was happening to them mm -hmm. that they associated with the trunk. And was the very first family part of the Dunkel family? Like, how did it get there in yeah. the first place? And why did no one just get rid of the trunk? Right. Maybe mm -hmm. like what? Like it influences you to like make it, like persuade you to not get rid of it. I know. I was like very Teresita Bossa in my Oh, yeah. Because I'm like, I just- What's the mystery? What is going on? Okay, and then you mentioned like, okay, the the cross. The spirit does escalate because it does grab uh, Zach, uh, yeah, Zach, mm -hmm. by the foot at some point. It's like, well, mm -hmm. is that Robert Dunkel? Did he smell cigarette smoke that time? I was just thinking also about this like 18-year-old boy sleeping on his parents' bedroom floor. That's right. how scared he was. Right. That is hysterical to me. Yeah, I'd be so scared too of, of just years of activity. Yeah, but but not, I mean, total not, not, barren, like not so mm -hmm. scared that he doesn't, and I get it. Yeah. I don't know, Zach, if you're still listening, I don't know uh, when you sent this story in, but like, have you done research to try and find out who Robert Dunkel is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, look into like genealogy records, you know, from your area or something, just, you know, like the uh, ancestry.com, 23andMe, some of those. And a uh, census, sometimes you can access like census databases. Oh, that's a good idea. And find out like, uh, you know, if that person ever lived there. Yeah. Their name would come up uh, associated with a birth certificate, marriage certificate. Oh, yeah, the address. like Just the census, you know, every 10 years, whatever. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. And also- um, They use your address. When you purchase a home, it is oh, yeah. public record. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Zach, you didn't give us our address. But like, if you can get the address of your mom's house, like where it yeah. originated from. That'll help you find him. Yeah. Did Robert Dunkel ever own that home? And then like on the, I don't know enough about the military, but I, I get the impression based on the external sticker on the uh, trunk that there's this number. It's like A03. I think it's a, a number assigned by the military to this person. Just the way oh, that- Oh yeah, some kind of military database. Right, so I'm like, okay, I was trying to like look it up, but I don't know if you use the whole number, if you use the number in the letter. I mean, at a certain point I had to stop yesterday yeah. because there are other Robert Dunkles, of course, but like on the sticker, it says something about like Fort Wayne. I think it was going from Fort Wayne, Indiana to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And Zach is telling us that, you know, he lived in Missouri. So I'm like, okay, kind right. of in the same area. Like, yeah. ha! <laughs> It's an unsolved mystery that's driving me crazy. <laughs> well, it was a great story. Yeah, great story. Yeah, thank you, Zach. And do you want to do some Annabelle shout outs? I would love to, Dan. Thank you for asking. Yeah. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for helping us to donate to the DNA Doe Project this month. Chris Rizzo, Robert Cariola, uh, Gerardo Avia, Amy Forness, David Schott, Nicole Lindstrom, Selena Raganesi, Common Cryptid, <laughs> Richard Graham, and Maureen Nino. Well, thank you, Annabelles, for letting us do what we do. Uh, I would also like to thank the following Annabelles of uh, here, uh, Alicia Mendez, Justin Partain, Carrie Currens, Travis Blomendahl, Dark Rooster Man, 
Lucas Yarka, Aaron Bone Any. Uh, it's in, it's in uh, parenthetical, or not parentheticals, uh, uh, quotes. Bone, E-N-E-E, Bone Eni. Bonini. Any. Okay, Bonini. so, so uh, what was the first name? Aaron, right? Aaron, yeah. Yeah, so Aaron sent a message, and that is n- not actually their last name. Her right. last name is Bowden, B-O-U-D-I-N. Yeah. But when their child was younger, couldn't say it. So it's just uh, like an inside okay, cute, family joke. Cute. Uh, Gretchen Van Bon, Paulette Rosario, Sonia, and TJ and Taco. TJ and Taco. Oh, TJ and Taco. Oh, TJ Tacos. Uh, also, I just want to backpedal one second on my uh, spooky shout outs. Yeah. At the end of Zach's story, he said, could you please give a huge shout out to my buddy, Timmy Brown, and have Dan politely ask him to stop sucking on Kevin's fingers? Uh, Timmy Brown, please stop sucking on, uh, wait, whose fingers? Kevin. Don't suck on Kevin's fingers anymore. It's weirding everybody out. <laughs> Timmy's a super good dude and a longtime <laughs> fan of Dan's comedy and has led the Bad Magic Parade within our workspace. Oh, that's nice. That's well, thank so you. cute. All right. And then the additional spooky shout outs. Yeah. To Jordan from Brittany, happy anniversary. I love you. To Dominic from, oh boy, I feel like I wrote this down wrong. I wrote down Brooker. I'm guessing it's supposed to be from Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> to Dominic from Brooke or Brooker, happy 29th birthday to the greatest husband and hottest dilf around. I ah. love you. That's cute. To Daniel from Shayna, keep your head up. Don't let the demons drag you down. To Brandon from Bryce, keep going. I'm proud of you. To Michael from Nicole, Donnie, and Marita, happy birthday. I'm sorry, happy belated birthday to the best and spoopiest hub- hubby, dog dad, and soon to be real dad. And to V Ron from Mo, happy birthday. I love you, oodles and bunches. Nice. Whew. And that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith and Tyler C for their work on social media with Ryan Handelsman and his team and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thank you to Tyler C for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And to our book editor, Drew Atana for polishing and preparing the listener stories for book number four. Thank you to producers uh, Sarah Finch and Olivia Lee for finding the second story I told this week. I found the first. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you'd like to watch this show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want to see the photos that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. Also at Scared to Death Podcast on TikTok if you want show highlights. And we have a private Facebook group called Creeps and Peepers, so get in there. Get in there. Uh, If you don't want to hear any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and more. And enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions. You just, it has to be really quiet and then you just hear her. Uh...